Since we reported the big money numbers raised by Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg yesterday, a few more fundraising totals have come in. Joe Biden raised nearly $23 million. Elizabeth Warren raised a little over $21 million. That shakes the order up from last quarter, putting Warren in fourth place and Biden in third. Also, Senator Amy Klobuchar had her best fundraising quarter, socking away $11 million, putting her in striking distance of Andrew Yang, but a huge quarter, raising $16 million. Now let's talk about the big issue going on in the country. The United States and Iran might be teetering on the brink of war. Tensions between the two countries were put on overdrive Thursday after the U.S. launched a second attack this week against its adversary. Now we wait to see how Iran responds. We're going to give you a rundown of what happened, who's cheering and who's criticizing, and the potential consequences America could be facing. I'm Jamal Simmons. Here's why you should care. The United States killed one of Iran's top military leaders on Thursday. The Pentagon confirmed General Qasem Soleimani was a target of an airstrike at Baghdad International Airport. Soleimani was a leader of the Iranian Quds forces and a major player in the Iranian government. There's no direct comparison to his role, but some experts have said his role would be like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who was also a major U.S. political official, maybe Secretary of State too. The deputy of an Iran-backed militia was also killed in the drone strike. In a statement, the Pentagon said the strike was, quote, aimed at deterring future Iranian attacks. The United States will continue to take all necessary action to protect our people and our interests. Democratic congressional leaders were not given advance warning, and there are questions about what authority the president used to carry out this action. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo doubled down on the Trump administration's decision to act against Iran. The world's a much safer place today. And I can assure you that Americans in the region are much safer today after the demise of Qasem Soleimani. Thursday's attack against Iran is the second one in the last week. On Sunday, the U.S. launched five airstrikes against Iranian-backed paramilitary groups. The administration says Soleimani was a dangerous man who was actively orchestrating assaults against the U.S., which could have put American lives at risk. The U.S. is not officially at war with Iran, and purposefully killing a foreign government official is tricky business. The action sent shockwaves through the Middle East, putting allies like Israel on increased alert. And right here at home, officials are ratcheting up threat levels and hardening infrastructure targets vulnerable to cyber attack. Meanwhile, the State Department has since advised that all American civilians leave Iraq. Reactions to last night's airstrike are coming in at a fast clip. Let's start with the person who directed the strike, President Trump. Just after the news broke of Soleimani's death, President Trump tweeted out an American flag. And just that, that was it. But earlier this morning, he had more to say. He tweeted, General Soleimani has killed or badly wounded thousands of Americans over an extended period of time and was plotting to kill many more, but got caught. GOP lawmakers are mostly standing by the president's decision. Marco Rubio, the senator from Florida, tweeted the defensive actions the U.S. has taken against Iran and its proxies are consistent with clear warnings they received. They chose to ignore these warnings because they believe POTUS was constrained from acting by our domestic political division. They badly miscalculated. But Democrats, on the other hand, disagree. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi released a statement saying the airstrike was not authorized and Congress was not consulted on the decision. She says tonight's airstrike risks provoking further dangerous escalation of violence. 2020 Democrats are also speaking out. Bernie Sanders took to Twitter to highlight his history of opposing war. And I'll tell you something, that right now I'm going to do everything that I can to prevent a war with Iran. Cory Booker voiced his concerns about a lack of a comprehensive strategic plan from the White House. What we do know is that Soleimani is a person with American blood on his hands. But we also know there are larger challenges, strategic challenges in that region. And we have a president who has failed to show any larger strategic plan. More reactions are sure to come. Unofficial estimates put the number of Iranian Americans in the United States at 1 to 2 million, living in several large metropolitan areas from New York to Atlanta to Los Angeles and Silicon Valley. Many of these families came to the United States to escape the repression that has held Iran in its grip since the late 1970s. Joining us now to talk about the possible impact of last night's attack in Iraq is Jamal Abdi, president of the National Iranian American Council. Thank you for joining us, Jamal. My pleasure. All right. So uh, we all woke up or last night. We went to sleep with news that the United States had attacked uh, this general 
in Iraq who was actually an Iranian who had such a major impact and had such a major role uh, in the Iranian military. So many, uh, more than just a general, he was by many accounts the second most powerful person inside of Iran. Um, Soleimani was responsible for Iran's regional policies, so really in charge of what Iran was doing, uh, whether it was Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, uh, vastly influential, and somebody who, you know, clearly had a, a mixed record internationally, to say the least, but inside of Iran, even among a population with uh, pretty serious concerns about their government, Soleimani uh, was viewed as sort of a savior of Iran by a lot of people. Soleimani actually led the struggle against ISIS and actually uh, sort of worked in parallel with the United States to defeat ISIS. I think arguably did more to defeat ISIS than, than any other single person in the, in the world. And for Iranians, uh, I think was sort of this protector who was able to kind of keep the country uh, safe from all of the catastrophes that were happening around Iran. But outside of Iran was somebody who had a very controversial record because, you know, he's working with these militias and proxies and, and, and uh, 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 supporting Assad and things, things of that nature. So I, I have seen reports that there were people in Iran who were protesting the government, including Soleimani, and who were worried that perhaps he was a little bit more of a repressive force against some of the reform because he was aligned with conservatives. Absolutely. He, th this is a hardliner. You know, this is somebody who was not interested in reform inside of Iran and loosening social restrictions. Uh, and really, you know, on the opposite side of where the Iranian president was uh, or, or is, uh, not somebody who believed that the Iran should be engaging with the outside world and seeking rapprochement, but somebody who believed Iran needed to resist and needed to actually have a strong military posture and be able to project force uh, as a defense for the country. So very much at odds with this, this attempted movement at reform or moderation inside of Iran. And somebody who, especially under Donald Trump, saw an even greater share of influence because this notion of engaging the outside world was, was so, uh, uh, you know, dismantled by what Trump did with the nuclear deal. And right. So the president, President Trump, has been from dismantling the Iran nuclear agreement to going after Iran with more sanctions. The president has been putting the clamp in on the Iranian economy and the Iranian leadership. What's been the impact of that on the ground for Iranian citizens that you've heard about? The impact is 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 vast. Uh, the economy is in dire straits. Um, just weeks ago, we saw the largest protests, uh, popular protests uh, across the country, and you know, 25, 30 different uh, provinces, uh, anywhere between you know 300 and a thousand people that were killed, uh, and you know, this was actually unthinkable uh, previously because of this understanding that Iranians were fearful of the disintegration of Iran and, and that there were going to be, you know, with ISIS and all these other forces that Iran was really under threat. I think what a lot of us who opposed maximum pressure and who thought these sanctions were a bad idea did not think that uh, such uh, disastrous consequences could be felt inside of Iran because the international community was not with Trump on these sanctions. And the fact is, it actually did have pretty drastic consequences, but they weren't consequences that fed a democracy movement. Instead, what we, what we have seen is that it just generated food riots and, and violent protests, protesting the, the regime, but not really a movement around democratizing. So we Did saw people say like, they're working. N no, I, I think that they've actually invited, you know, because of the, the fact that they were violent protests, they've given actually cover for the Revolutionary Guard and the Soleimani types to actually use more violence and repression and to say that we need to clamp down internally. Okay, so in a moment like this, where the United States does something so overt to go after an Iranian government official, does that strengthen the hand of reformers inside the country, or does it strengthen the hand of the conservatives who are trying to clamp down on any reform and maybe rally the population to the national flag? I think this is going to unify uh, folks inside of Iran. I think that that is very likely what the case is going to be. As far as reformers... So we're be working in opposite to the U.S. government's stated intention, which is to have regime change in the country through internal measure. Well, the, you know, the U.S. government wants, supposedly wants negotiations. I think that's off the table now. The Iran is not going to negotiate, at least not with the Trump administration. Um, if the idea is the disintegration of Iran, the economic collapse and a failed state, I think this actually potentially does, you know, feed that. Um, but it also gives the hardline elements the upper hand in being able to control that. And any idea of internal reform and 
reaching out to the outside world, I mean, they haven't, they've, they've cut off the hand of the reformists with this move. So what will happen, do you think, what, the, what will the Iranian government be doing right now? What, what are they thinking in Tehran? How will they be coming back at the United States after such an attack as the one we witnessed last night? That is the million dollar question right now. Uh, Iran is uh, well versed in asymmetric warfare. I think that they have many ways that they can make life very painful for the United States as well as U.S. allies in the region, the Saudis, UAE, uh, Israel. Uh, and I think what remains to be seen is how far is Iran willing to take this? Until now, Iran has been very calculated in responding to Donald Trump. So have, they've taken very provocative actions. Uh, the, you know, the alleged bombing of the Saudi oil facilities, the, you know, attacks on tankers that have been alleged. Those are provocative actions, but there was always this, uh, this uh, restraint to not cross lines that may trigger a U.S. blowback in actual war with the United States. Now I fear all bets may be off and that Iran is increasingly a government and a country with nothing to lose. And you've got some, a country with nothing to lose now uh, uh, sort of pushed to the brink by this action. And I think that uh, anything is possible. So I talked to people who said, listen, American generals and officials may have targets on their back because now we've got government officials being, uh, uh, the, the sort of wool has been pulled off of this and now you can have government officials being targeted. Cyber attacks are something that might be um, in response. You may see the things you mentioned like tankers abroad. Uh, Israel is in some level of, of jeopardy. So. You say that the Iranian government uh, maybe doesn't have any restraint that's left on them. Are these some of the things that the United States should be prepared for? Yeah, I think so. And I don't know that the United States is prepared for these things. Uh, there's also the nuclear program, which was for so long a fascination with Washington. And thanks to the nuclear deal, was put uh, under curbs. Iran has started to break out of that deal and actually announced, uh, you know, many months ago that the next uh, sort of... Uh, uh, the, the next opportunity for, for Iran to remove restraints from that deal, to basically begin doing even more sensitive nuclear work, is coming on January 6th. And so, whereas before there was an understanding maybe that would be sort of a, a modest move meant to put pressure on the U.S., but not actually cross any red lines, again, now I could see the Iranians doing something very provocative on that front and testing Europe and the international community, who is certainly not aligned with Trump on this, uh, and now is in, in even more of a conundrum because of this extrajudicial assassination of an Iranian official. All right, last question. You're advising, let's say, for instance, you get a call from Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, one of these people who's running for president, and they ask you, what does the United States do to, to change the relationship with Iran and make it a productive one and not one where we're in adversarial positioning against each other? What is the advice you give to American politicians about what to do? At this stage... I think that there is no greater urgency than defeating Donald Trump if this is not the pathway we want to go down, a pathway towards war with Iran. The assassination of Soleimani, I think, has the potential of locking the United States into that war. Until now, the Trump policy in Iran has been uh, a matter of open wounds, exiting the Iran deal, imposing the Muslim ban. These policies could all be reversed. And there was a sense that the next president, you know, the first debate, they were, the candidates were asked, would you return to the Iran nuclear deal? And most raised their hand and said yes. Now I don't know if that's possible. And I think what needs to happen right now is this crisis needs to be laid at the feet of the president. This cannot be allowed to be something where the war drums begin, Iran retaliates, and suddenly the U.S. population says, you know what, we do need to retaliate to Iran and enter this state of war. So we need leadership right now to make it very clear where we're at, that this was, an, uh, this was an avoidable crisis, that abandoning the nuclear deal led us here. And really, I think we need some pledges about what the next president is going to do to get us out of this mess. All right, Jim Malabdi, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for watching Hill TV on YouTube. Be sure to click subscribe and hit the bell so you know when we post new videos. And head to thehill.com for all the latest political news.